Hey, everybody. So for our final podcast in the Unit 1 series, we're going to be talking about the Mediterranean and Middle East from 2000 to 500 BCE. And the timeline we're going to be focusing on, we've discussed Egypt already. Uh, we're going to come back to the Mediterranean region later um, in terms of Minoan, Crete, and Mycenaean Greece. But today we're going to focus on the Syria-Palestine region, um, the Kingdom of Israel. We're going to talk about the Assyrian Empire, Neo-Babylonia, and then we're going to move on to Phoenicia and the Carthage Empires. So our key concepts, as always, nothing new for you. Moving along. Again, review of the empires. And first things first, knowing where which countries belong in which parts of Asia are very, very important. So what I've put up here are a couple of maps that break down the countries that are in each geographic region of Asia. And unfortunately, we don't spend a lot of time talking about Central Asia. We do, however, spend a lot of time talking about Western Asia. So you really want to make sure that you're familiar with where Turkey and Georgia are. They play a really important role um, in the building of civilizations, the Ottoman Empire, um, everybody wants Georgia for its geographic locations. We're going to be talking a lot about that later on. You really need to know where Syria is. Not only is it an incredibly important region for empires, but today it's the center of a massive civil war. Um, Israel and Palestine, very important to know these regions. Um, we're actually going to talk about the tensions between Israel and Palestine and the root of these tensions. Southeast Asia, also very important. Know where Indonesia is. We talked extensively about that in the uh, Pacific Voyagers podcast. Know where... Cambodia, the Philippines, Indonesia, again, uh, shares an island with Papua New Guinea, Malaysia. These are really important, guys. Southern Asia. Um, I can't tell you how often people mistake Afghanistan um, and Iran for being in Western Asia. And a lot of that I think anyway, may have to do with the wars the U.S. has been in with Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, they are in two very different locations, though. Um, it is what it is. Uh, India, also noting where Bangladesh and Pakistan are. Those are some newer countries. A hundred years ago, they were not nation states. Now they are. Eastern Asia, for the most part, it's China. Uh, Mongolia, know where that is, North and South Korea, Japan, and Taiwan. Northern Asia, Russia. All right, so let's dive right in, folks. Um, when we're talking about Israel, um, the ancient kingdom that is Israel, um, a, lot of, a lot of times when people think about this kingdom, what comes to mind is the Hebrew Bible, which then becomes the basis for the Christian Bible. And the region along the Eastern Mediterranean is called the Levant. It's divided into three regions, Lebanon, Israel, and Palestine. And the Hebrew Bible was written about 700 BCE, and the most current version dates back to 500 BCE. And remember, my disclaimer, not telling you what to believe, just teaching the curriculum, folks. Um, the historical value of the Hebrew Bible is greatly debated um, because it was not written start to finish, completed, and never touched again at one time. It was assembled over a number of years and then updated after it was assembled. And what's very interesting is that Within the Hebrew Bible, there's the story of a great flood that destroyed most of humanity. And a lot of people know the story, Noah's Ark, but the same flood story is actually told in the Epic of Gilgamesh. And what's really interesting is that there is evidence of a massive flood in this area. 
And again, that's where your own personal beliefs come in. Was it a flood that destroyed the world? Was it a flood that only destroyed the known world, which at that point wasn't very big? That is up to you. Um, Hebrews believed, in addition, that some people who were called prophets could talk directly to God. And Abraham is a very important part of the Hebrew Bible because Hebrews believe that their God chose Abraham to be their leader. And God spoke directly to Abraham. And Abraham is often tested by his God who asked him to sacrifice his son Isaac. And these stories are found within the Hebrew Bible. It also recounts the exodus of Hebrews out of Egypt. However, uh, there is no archaeological evidence of a single migration out of Egypt. However, there is archaeological evidence that establishes the presence of the Hebrews in Palestine between 1300 and 1100 BCE. And there's evidence of 12 to 15,000 Hebrews in small villages within this region. Um, there's no evidence of cities of Hebrews before 11,000 BCE. And a couple of things that come up. Um, trash tells a lot about a civilization. And that is one thing that archaeologists love is finding, I want to say old trash, but that's pretty much it. Um, looking through trash because your garbage tells a lot about you. Think about what you guys throw away on a daily basis. That would tell me a lot about how you live, what you eat, what you buy, yada, yada, yada. And within these garbage pits, if you will, there's no evidence of pig bones. And this does reflect that the Hebrews prohibited the eating of pork. And we also know that within this, um, this area, there were large urban centers with large walls that begin to appear between 1000 and 900 BCE. And that gives us the evidence of a complex society. Around 1000 BCE, the population of the Levant was in the neighborhood of 150,000 people. And Jerusalem's maximum population was hit in 700 BCE with 5,000 people. Jerusalem was never as large a city as places were in Mesopotamia or in ancient Egypt. And what you also have to keep in mind is just the size, the incredible difference in size between the Israel-Palestine region and ancient Egypt or Mesopotamia. Some of these cities were the size of this area. And a couple of things that we also know, the biblical accounts aside from Abraham, include Isaac and Jacob. And these stories may be compressed accounts of the experiences of many generations of nomads that were then put together. And a great example is the story of Cain and Abel. So you have the nomad versus the, or the, the herder, the nomad versus the farmer. And you also have the stories of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And that could reflect the tensions between the nomadic Israelite people and settled agricultural people. And again, going back to the mass exodus of Egypt, the biblical account of Egyptian cat captivity is not confirmed by Egyptian sources, but it might be linked to the rise and fall of the Hiksu rulers of Egypt. And the period of Israelite slavery, according to the Bible, does actually correspond with large-scale large construction projects under Sethos I and Ramses II. And the biblical account of the Exodus may reflect the memories of a migration from Egypt and nomadic life. Um, and the people who actually partook in this migration were called a Peru, which does sound similar to Hebrew. The cult of Yahweh, for the most part, had exclusive devotion to one god, Yahweh, uh, during the period of nomadism in the Sinai. But hold that thought for just a minute. The biblical account of Israelite settlement in the land of Canaan says that Joshua led the Israelites and destroyed Jericho and other cities. But what we do know happened later is many of the followers of Joshua actually began following another god um, by the name of Baal. And we'll talk about him a little later.
So Abraham is a pretty important person, not just in the Hebrew faith or in the, uh, the Jewish faith, excuse me, but also in the Christian faith as well as the Islamic faith. So Abraham is married to Sarah. Um, they have a son, Isaac. Isaac has a son, Jacob, who is the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. But Ag- Abraham with Hagar has a son, Ishmael. Ishmael is the father of the 12 Arabian tribes. So he, he plays a very important role. All right. So continuing on, rise of the monarchy in Israel, wars with the Philistines, who were a non-Semitic people in southern Palestine, brought about the need for a very strong central government. And Saul was the first king who established a monarchy. David was the second king. And if you if you have ever read some of the stories in the Hebrew Bible, um, these do correlate. So we do know there actually was a Saul, the first king. We do know that David did exist. We also know that King Solomon did exist. These are real people. The Israelite monarchy reached the height of its power under King Solomon. He forged alliances and sponsored trade, and he also expanded the bureaucracy and the power of the army. And he built the first temple in Jerusalem. And this temple sacrificed to the god Yahweh. And the priests would receive a portion of the sacrifices. And we're not just talking animal sacrifices. It's sacrifices of crops, uh, money. And they become very wealthy. In early Israel, women enjoyed relative equality. And, and this got cut off. I apologize for that. Um, women could not inherit property. That's kind of an issue. Um, so they're completely dependent on their husbands. All right, so quickly, just to finish this up, um, Israel split um, around 800 BCE. You have the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. And that's very important because one will fall before the other. And these two kingdoms were sometimes at peace and sometimes they were at war. And... There were a number of religious developments during this fragmentation, strengthening in the belief of Yahweh. Um, but during this time, with these religious developments, you have political fragmentation. And eventually, the Assyrian Empire destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel in 721. And Judah would fall to the, Bab- the Neo-Babylonian monarch Nebuchadnezzar in 587 BCE. And Nebuch- Nebuchadnezzar would deport a large number of Jewish elites and craft people to Babylon. And this was his way of controlling the population, of spreading the knowledge and the skills. And this was the beginning of the Jewish, Jewish diaspora. And during this time, the people developed institutions to preserve their Jewish culture and religion. And these developments would continue to flourish and to spread even after Babylonian Jews were allowed to go back to Jerusalem. And many of them actually chose to stay in Babylon. All right, our next two empires are Assyria and Neo-Babylonian. And you can see their regions. They're quite large. Um, you also notice they kind of overlap with each other. And that's because the real height of the Neo-Babylonian Empire was taking down the Assyrians. All right, so just, again, quick review. Assyrian had their origins in the northern Tigris area. They're in Mesopotamia. They're involved in trade uh, with tin and silver. And what you should know is that Babylonian doesn't pursue territorial conquests right away. Once they hit their height, they're more focused about trade. All right, so the Assyrian Empire. The homeland, like I said, northern Mesopotamia, and it had more rain and a more temperate climate than Sumar and Akkad. But it's also more exposed to raiders, which is why the Assyrian Empire had to build up such a strong military. They would invade Israel, Judah, and Mesopotamia, and Egypt after or before 721 BCE. And they were able to do this because they had iron weapons and a very impressive cavalry. Assyrian demanded that conquered people submit to their king and their gods. And those who said, okay, I'm in, just let me live, 
were treated very well. And one of the interesting things about the Assyrian Empire is if you submitted, you said, hey, you know, you know what, you guys won. It's all good. Then you are guaranteed to live. But if you resisted, if you would not accept the king and if you would not accept the religion, bad things would happen to you. And one of the things that we, you know, we really try to encourage in this class is that you really shouldn't judge and times were different. But the Assyrians were a very sick, twisted people. I'm going to be honest with you on that. And here's why, guys. Those who did not submit to the will of the conquerors, those who did not submit to the new religion and king, were made an example of. And quite often, they would be brought in public and skinned alive. Or sometimes burn at the stake. If you were lucky, maybe you just lost your hand. Maybe they would cut your hand off from everybody. Or maybe they would just cut your head off. That would be the better way to go than being skinned alive. It was not exactly a fun place to be if you were the loser. And the king was often perceived as godlike. Um, as you can see, the Assyrian kings were regarded as the center of the universe, chosen by the gods as the human incarnate. And the kings were designed and sort of lifted up on a pedestal. You can see the uh, the head of a king on the body of an animal. Or my personal favorite, the king literally slaying the lion with one hand. Isn't that, that's very impressive. In addition to religious duties, the king also had secular duties, including hearing and deciding on complaints, carrying out military leadership, receiving information. But he also supervised state religion, um, supervised rituals, and consulted getting the approval of the gods. At their peak, the Assyrian army had half a million troops into functionally specialized units there you go guys so not only do you have a highly trained military there's different jobs they can have they can be weapon specialists they can be the cavalry they can be messengers they can be the one who lights the fire that says hey guys they're coming or you also have spy networks their t military tactics were ingenious especially considering the time frame and once they would conquer an area, they would actually resettle people, uh, very similar to Babylon. And Assyrian techniques of resettling, it was done for two reasons, um, terror tactics, and also, again, spreading the knowledge. We need to transfer labor. We need to crush the morale of the enemy or whatever morale they have left after seeing their friends skinned alive. And also to build up projects, create buildings. And you're actually going to see one of these buildings in just a minute. It's very impressive. But the problem is the Assyrians found it very difficult to control their very diverse empire. In particular, people from Israel and Judah were relocated forcibly throughout the Assyrian empire. And within the empire, the duties of Assyrian officials had um, were to collect tribute and taxes, maintain law and order, and make sure that agriculture was um, and the crops were being stored properly. And here's the other thing. This is a great example of bureaucracy. The level of control varied. If you have a, a, um, a leader or a governor, if you will, and you were located closer to the center, the king still had control. The further you got from the, the core, the greater power the governor had. And sometimes that could be a good thing, other times not so much. And here's a great example of Assyrian architecture. The Assyrian government, like I said, uh, I mentioned this before, if you submitted and you said, hey, you know what, it's, it's okay, you, you guys won, welcome. Um, they really didn't distinguish native Assyrians and immigrants, and all were considered to have equal rights and responsibilities if you just paid your taxes. The economy was based on agriculture, but there were also artisans and merchants. And the Assyrians preserved knowledge inherited from older Mesopotamian societies. And what you can see here is the very impressive library that contains over 1,500 complete texts. And the Assyrian king, Ashurbanipal, built this. This is actually called uh, the, the Library of Ashurbanipal. And it is one of the biggest libraries of its time. It's actually the first library that was ever built. 
And it also included the most complete copy of the Epic of Gilgamesh that we have. So we actually got that from this place, guys. It's very nice. All right. So the Babylonian Empire rose up. Um, began in 625, but solidified their power in 612 by conquering the Assyrian Empire. And they rebuilt the city of Babylon for its capital. Now, the most famous leader of the Neo-Babylonian Empire, so-called because it's the second Babylonian Empire, is Nebuchadnezzar II. And he would rule from 605 to 562 BCE. And he's famous for a number of reasons. Um... The Jewish diaspora is one. Um, he extended his empire to Syria, Palestine, and Lebanon. Um, but in addition, he also built the Hanging Gardens. And they're considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And obviously, they're no longer there. But it's guessed that this is what it looked like. And he unintentionally did something else that is incredibly important. And when he deported thousands of Hebrews to Babylon, this is actually called the Babylonian captivity. Um, the exiled Hebrew community reinterpreted their past. And what happens is in the past, the Hebrews had worshiped different gods aside from Yahweh. Um, the second most popular is Baal and his wife. And this mass deportation solidified the belief that Yahweh should be the only God that is to be worshipped. Now, what's really interesting, guys, is Baal was seen as a, a spirit, uh, a God to be worshipped. But in Christianity and Islam, he's referred to as Beelzebub. And Beelzebub is another word that's used for the devil. And in the Catholic faith, Baal or Beelzebub is one of the seven princes of hell. And it's very interesting how history sort of changes itself to fit the current situation. And then how years down the road, people take that and then sort of change it to fit their needs. Um, Babylonian captivity and the power of Babylon ended when the Persians conquered Babylon in 539 BCE. But at this point with the Hebrews, the Bible stressed that monotheism of the Hebrews with the god Yahweh was the way it was going to be. And this is actually one of the last updates that happens in the Hebrew Bible. All right, so we're going to wrap up with Phoenicia and the Mediterranean. Especially we're going to talk a little bit about Carthage today. And you can really see just how far their empire expands. The Phoenician colony is in orange. So here are its headquarters. But la, 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 look how far it goes. Um, the phrase the Phoenician triangle has been used quite often to describe its trading routes. All right. Phoenician city-states. As we know, the Phoenicians were the descendants of the ancient inhabitants of Syria, Lebanon, and Israel. <coughs> and the Phoenicians were able to establish a number of small city-states that were incredibly dependent on commerce. And the most famous contribution to history of the Phoenicians was a new system of writing. And it was an alphabet that was more based on sound, and they, call, they will call this the phonetic alphabet. And if you've ever heard of the phonics system, you can thank the Phoenicians for that. This is also why I can't pronounce words very well. Um, as you've already heard my rants, when I was in kindergarten, my school decided to try a little experiment out. And this is Pennsylvania, so this is not county schools. Every town was a different school district. And the town decided, let's do an experiment. We're going to teach this group of kids to read using something that's not the phonic system. So we weren't taught using how to sound out words and the rules of grammar, because there, there are rules for how letters sound when they're next to other letters. Um, what they found was our reading was fine, but we couldn't pronounce words at all. 
And this is a problem that has stuck with a number of my classmates for years on end. Uh, we had a lot of intervention specialists come in when we were in first, second, and third grade. But the problem is the damage was done. Um, you'd actually have to teach people all over again on, on the rules of grammar and how to how to pronounce words. So it's super fun. And thank you so much, Maine Elementary. Really appreciate that one. In addition to trade, um, the Phoenicians were also pretty fierce warriors. We'll get into that in just a second. But here's a great example of the Phoenician alphabet. And it's actually very close to the alphabet that we use today in the U.S. All right, so here are some the, the sea roots of the Phoenicians. Again, we've got that Phoenician triangle. And Phoenician expansion into the Mediterranean was carried out first by Tyre, beginning in the 9th century BCE. Colonies were established on Cyprus and then on the North African coast and then on the Spanish coast, Sardinia, Sicily, and Malta. And expansion was a response to the Assyrian invasions of Syria and Palestine. And there was also an agricultural shortage in Tyre and opposition to trade and access to resources thanks to the growing empires. But Carthage was established. And if we go back just a minute, here we go. You can see where Carthage is right here. There we go. Um, and they were established around 814 BCE. And it's a walled city that had two judges that were selected from an upper class family, not voted, selected, and by a Senate that was dominated by the leading merchant class families. And what this tells us is that Carthage, based on trade, pays to be a merchant. The Navy was the most important arm of Carthaginian power. Citizens served as rowers and navigators of these very fast warships. And Carthaginian foreign policy and military activity were in the service of trade. And the whole point of this, of this military activity is to really develop a monopoly in the Mediterranean and develop new trading opportunities. And they're active not only in the Mediterranean, but also in trade with sub-Saharan Africa. So this is the city, and there's an artificial harbor that could be closed off during an attack, which is pretty cool. And thing is, water is all here. The only way to get from these boats into these houses is to actually go into the harbor and dock and then get out. So you close this off, and the city is essentially safe from attack, seeing as it's surrounded by a 40-foot-tall wall. Carthaginians made no attempt to build a territorial empire. Their empire was about trade. It was about getting more trading routes. And the military was subordinate to the civilian government. And unfortunately, they were consisted of mercenary soldiers. And the problem is, if you can't pay your soldiers, you, you might find some issue there. The Carthaginian empire was kind of depressing and sad. Um, it focused on the worship of gods that could only be appeased by the sacrifice of children. And historians and archaeologists have found um, urns filled with ash and small bones, which are the, the bones of children. Quite often it was the firstborn son of nobles that were killed. And, I mean, guys, the Romans are the ones who really kind of personified crucifixion where your heart explodes in your chest after you're left to hang and die for days. And when the Romans, who also, you know, took part in gladiators and slaying lions and people being eaten by tigers, when they think that you're a sad, gloomy people, you know something's not quite right. And the Carthaginians were very harsh on their subjects. All right, so some food for thought that I want to leave you with. Think about the changes and continuities in the Middle East between 200 and 5, 2500 BCE, especially with political structure, and analyze the similarities and differences in religious beliefs in two of the following civilizations, New Kingdom of Egypt, Israel, Assyria, and Carthage. So you might want to tap back into an old PowerPoint just to review on that. 
but that, that'll really help you for the test. So, all right. It's about 11 o'clock, which means I'm going to go to sleep. So have a great night, guys. Cheers.